The work the SAG Foundation is doing is enormously important. From the up and coming actors to the veterans like myself, the Foundation is here to help all of us. As fellow artists, we've all been there. It's crucial that we remember where we came from and help out however we can. For over 25 years, the SAG Foundation has been the industry's best kept secret, and we're out to change that. As natural storytellers, it's great that we have the opportunity to give back through the Children's Literacy Program. A disaster like Sandy really brings it home with how crucial the SAG Foundation is. Their donation drive helped so many people in need. The seminars and workshops are crucial. Working together is what makes us better. The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies solely on donations to keep these important programs free for everyone. The SAG Foundation can't do it alone. We need you. If you need help, ask. If you can help, give. We're all in this together. 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 Together, everyone benefits. Join the cause. Back now. Hello, good evening again, guys. Good evening to everyone on the live stream. Thanks for viewing. My name is Dennis Baker. I'm the Life Raft Program Director here. A couple things before we get started. Um, as you can see, we have a good amount of people in here. Unfortunately, there's been a trend of events where we've been having a lot of no-shows, and a lot of that is because guests have not been showing up, or you sign up at a guest and they don't come. So I need to ask you guys, if you do sign up a guest, it is your responsibility for have that guest to attend. Um, if guests don't attend, we will remove that privilege from signing up for events, and it'll just have to be SAG after and equity members. So if you want the privilege of bringing guests, if you are live stream right now and didn't come because you're like, oh, I can do it on the live stream, or guests or something like that, know that that is a privilege that can be taken away and might not be used as often for events. So I ask you guys, if you sign up for a guest, be responsible for that guest attending. Make sense? Because I think that's for everyone. Because all these seats, there was people on the waiting list that didn't attend because there was guests signed up and then guests don't show and that's not fair to people who are on the wait list. Make sense for everyone? So I just want to make that clear for everyone and make that understood. Um, other than that, we are really working hard to be on social media and to get the word out there as many places as possible. So we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash SAG Foundation, link us there. Twitter.com slash SAG Foundation, S-A-G Foundation. And the most important is YouTube, youtube.com slash SAG Foundation, because that directly connects with the live stream. And the events immediately after the event goes directly to that, and you can watch it as soon as you get home. So for tonight, like I said, it's going to be a jam-packed hour of information. I guarantee you won't take um, all the notes you want to take or get all the information you want to get. One, this is a one-on-one -on -one, on -one -on -one session, just the beginning. You will need to do the research of everything that's talked about here to figure out what you need specifically for your type of computer, your type of situation, and to go home and rewatch the video to get more information and to um, rehear it. Because whatever you get tonight doesn't mean you can actually go home and do it. You need to practice. All these things, as much as we said with the self-taping first part, it's all about practice. Practice, 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 as we all know. So check those things out. Lastly, what I want to say, and check my notes here, is that again, we work on donations and grants. Some ways to think about this. Last year, we did the total. We did 432 Life Raft conversation and camp events last year in 2012. If you were doing the math and divided that by 12, that meant 36 CAP, Life Raft, or conversation events per month. 36. That's a lot. And as much as that's a lot, we still get people saying, we want more CAP events. We more, want more Life Raft. We've got a nod here, more CAP events because of restrictions and things like that. I guarantee you tonight, CAP is a casting access project. Um, there will be notes about that tonight as well. So what happens is for that to work is we have a small staff and we need your help. Part of the grants, people said, came to us and said, part of ownership is seeing that people who participate also financially donate. So if you look to your right, there is a cash box there for donations if you have a couple bucks. It costs $16 per seat. We did the math. So every time you sit in that seat for one of those events, it costs us $16. If you can give five bucks, if you can give a buck, if you can do go online, there's a donate button on the right of our page. If you can be a sustaining member and give $5 a month or $10 a month, it's the, probably the best deal in town that I know of for a potential 36 events a month. 
pretty good deal. So if you have the means to do that, we ask that you look and do that. Also, too, we have financial assistance for people who have trouble paying their rent and things like that. So if you do need help, give us a call and we can figure that out if it's something that we can help you with. Also, too, the money that you give might be helping the person next to you pay their rent for their month because we all know that acting life sometimes has its ups and downs. Make sense? Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys on the live stream for watching again. I'm excited for tonight because there's a lot of great information to help you guys figure out how to get your auditions recorded and to the people that need to see them. I want to introduce our technical um, production manager, Marcus. Give him a hand. All right. Hello, everybody. Let me just wake up my computer here so that we can get started. Um, so, like Dennis said, my name is Marcus Lodwick. I'm the technical production manager here at the Screen Actors Guild Foundation. Uh, you'll probably recognize me, many of you, if you've been to events before. I'm often the one who's back there running the rack, or I'm behind the curtain running the live stream. So, chiming off of what Dennis said before, the uh, YouTube channel is a tremendous resource for us. Not only do they let us live stream for free, uh, which is great, those videos are immediately accessible. And since I'm doing a lot of technical information today, rewatching it is a, a smart idea. And when you do, or if you found something particularly useful, you can kind of just put like a time, uh, you know, 21 minutes, 30 seconds, and put a little comment like, you know, this part about Final Cut Pro is really useful. That way, when your fellow actor comes to watch the video, they'll see that comment and they can click that link and it'll jump straight to that part of the video. So it's kind of a neat feature that they have there. So. All right, so um, I'm kind of going to start off with a PowerPoint presentation. I've got a lot of notes here and stuff. Some of the information is going to be really simple, and you're going to wonder why I'm mentioning it at all. Uh, some of it's going to be really complex, and it's okay not to understand it, and it's okay not to memorize these details. The point of what I want to do is I just want these things to kind of get filed into the back of your brain so that when you see a term, you kind of are aware of the bigger picture and how those things interact with each other, and we'll hopefully be able to help you find uh, these answers again on the future, because most of the stuff, like, it's just too much for anybody to know. Uh, the whole point is to relearn it every time you need it, you know? So, and definitely won't be able to cover everything tonight about post-production. It's a really big topic. Uh, I could go on and on about this for weeks, probably. <laughs> and that's the real difference between, you know, like I always tell people, like anybody can, can be an editor. You guys have all watched a lot of TV and movies, and you're all actors. You guys all have a feel for pacing and how things should be. Um, what really sets people apart is the technical knowledge that goes into it. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to retain a lot of this so that you can uh, put together your own projects and stuff, not even just uh, you know, auditions, but you know, short films and stuff like that. So. Um, again, uh, we're going to try to hold questions off until uh, the second half of the event, just so that we can try to get through as much as we can. And um, to start right off, uh, I think the most basic thing that everybody should know, and some people aren't as familiar with computers as other people, so, but the very basics is how to research, how to find out the answers to your questions. Um, so the first thing you should know is that there's a lot of things called like uh, search operators which are ways to modify your search terms when you're going to Google or to uh, Bing or any of these different search engines. And by using these terms, you can kind of refine the results that you're going to get to make things a little bit more relevant and make things a little less frustrating when you're trying to comb through some really complex or vast topics and stuff. Um, most people probably already know about, you know, you can put quotation marks around a search term to search for that exact term. Uh, so like, for example, Final Cut Pro, you might put that in quotation marks. So it's not just picking up the one word final, the one per, per, uh, cut, and trying to give you all these relevant results that aren't really relevant at all. Uh, the next thing is like the minus. You can negate a term out of a search topic. Uh, so if you're not interested in that at all, like for example, a lot of times when you're searching for stuff, you'll get cluttered with a lot of like, kind of like websites designed to make money. They just want you to like come and click and install their product, free stuff online. You can do a minus free and try to cut some of that clutter out so that things are just a little bit more efficient for you. The tilde is something I use a lot. If you don't know the exact 
thing that you want to search for. Like if you're trying to search for rock, but you know, that's, there's a lot of words for rock, you know. So you could put a tilde rock, and that will also branch out to earth and all, all kinds of other words that are similar to that word. And that will just, you know, broaden your search a little bit so that for certain words you can uh, refine it that way. Um, if you search for search operators, you'll find guides online for you know, lists of things that you can do. I'm going to mention a few of them here. Um, filters. Uh, almost every search engine out there will have a way to filter information. You know, if you go to Google right now, you'll have a way to filter it. So you, you just search for images, search, just search for videos. Uh, in particular, videos is a really useful one because pretty much anything that you have a question about, someone out there has recorded a video and posted it online somewhere. So you can just find a quick little tutorial about how do I do this on my phone or how do I change these settings on my camera. Almost all of that is now online uh, by somebody. Uh, discussions is another one that you can filter on there that I use all the time. Uh, filtering something by discussion will show you mostly like forum posts where somebody out there who had a question asked it and people responded to it on that particular forum. Um, this is a really good way to also see like multiple, you know, there's not usually just one way to fix anything. There's a lot of different things that people can do and a lot of different problems that are similar. But you can see that back and forth and see somebody actually resolve an issue and then know that maybe that, that will also work for you. Um, one other thing that you can do, there's advanced tools uh, like date ranges. And this is really useful for if you're searching for something like Final Cut Pro again. Um, and you know maybe you're using Final Cut Pro X, and that's a newer version of it. Uh, um, you could restrict that search by using the, the date filter to say just the last three months of things that were posted on the internet. That's what I want to look at right now, or the last year, or whatever you want. Um, so that's a really useful way to do that. I, of course, mentioned Wikipedia on here. You shouldn't ever trust 100% of everything that you read online. You should always take things with a little bit of skepticism. But Wikipedia is a really great place to start off your process of researching. Uh, most topics are really accurate and stuff. And it's a great place to just get uh, a broad overview. And a lot of times, they'll also have ex links to external websites that explain things, as well as uh, uh, sources, uh, official websites, things like that. that will be good for any topic. So all of this applies to anything you want to learn about, not just post-production. Something else I use a lot is uh, you can do a site-specific search. So if you're using a Microsoft product and you want to search online for stuff about that product, you don't have to search the whole internet. You can s narrow it down by using this site uh, colon and then the website and then space and then the search topic. And that will narrow it for, for this example here. That will only search for support pages on Microsoft's website so that you can narrow your search dramatically so that you don't have to spend so much time trying to figure out how to do things. Um, all right. Um, some tips about just basic internet stuff. Um, just because a lot of people out there aren't as safe and secure on their online stuff as they should be. And it's kind of like something smart to just to mention. Um, but if you're ever unsure about a link that you emailed, you know, a lot of times they're hidden by those URL shorteners or something like that, like you know, the Google or Bitly or Owly. And it'll obscure what that website is because they want to make the link as short as possible. And you're not sure about that. You don't want to just blindly click it. That's OK. You can actually search on Google or other search engines for, is this URL safe, or something like that. And you'll get a whole bunch of websites that will actually let you just copy paste that link in there. And it'll do a little test on there and say, yes, it's safe. You can, you can use this site. We don't detect any bad stuff on there. Um, you can never be sure these days on the internet when things are going to be good or when things are going to be bad. So um, you always want to make sure that your software is up to date in particular for Java and Flash, which are browser uh, plugins that uh, almost everybody in this room will have. They enhance the way that uh, you view websites. Um, you'll need Flash to upload your videos to various websites and stuff. And you want to make sure that you do that through Adobe's website for Flash, uh, not just blindly clicking you know, 
it says my Flash player is out of date. I better click their link for it. Uh, you want to do it through them uh, directly just to make sure that you're getting exactly what you want to get. Um, and that's just good advice for anything. Um, you can also download uh, extensions for your browser, things like Adblock or NoScript. These are names of uh, extensions you can get for things like Google Chrome or Firefox. Um, and what these things do is they, they basically will, it's like setting up a rule in your browser that basically just blocks that content from operating unless you specifically tell it, yes, please show me this Flash content, or yes, please, I want to see JavaScript on this website. And that will also help uh, protect your guys' computers and stuff, just in general. Um, last note about security is to make sure that you're using strong passwords. Uh, people always tell you this, and uh, this is one of those things that, you know, even I'm guilty of using weak passwords from time to time and not changing them as frequently as you should. You really, really should, though. And people, uh, as clever as you think you are, there's no amount of vowel substitution that you can do to make a word secure. If your password is password with an at sign and some dollar signs in there, that is not a secure password. Um, it basically should be a password that you can't read in an English language. Um, it should be, you know, capital letters, lowercase letters, random digits, random keyboard, you know, things, whatever they'll let you put in. And the longer, the better. And I like to use the analogy of like, if you're if a car thief is in a parking lot and they're trying to figure out which car to steal, they're going to go for the one that's the easiest to break into. If they if you got the the club and all this fancy security stuff on there, they're just going to skip it because it's not worth the time, you know. And it's the same thing with your passwords. If your some website gets hacked and your password is in the batch of passwords that they've stolen, uh, the computer that they run is going to they're going to prefer to crack the easiest passwords first because you're also probably the ones who are going to be most likely to click the link that they email you, you know? So that's just good to know. Getting back to m some more specific stuff to post-production, there are tutorial websites online, amazing resources for learning things. Uh, Lynda.com is the first one I put on there. They have pretty much everything you want to know. This is a paid website, but they do have free stuff up to a point. Like, you might get the first 10 lessons free, and then after that, they get into more advanced topics, and then you'll, you, you get a subscription. But once you have a subscription, you can use anything on their site, basically. Um, CreativeCow.net, VideoCopilot.net, those are both, um, VideoCopilot's more uh, special effects type tutorials, but CreativeCow has, just in general, Adobe uh, websites and stuff like that. that uh, Adobe uh, programs like Premiere, um, Flash, uh, anything like that in After Effects. Um, LAFCPUG is the Los Angeles uh, Final Cut Pro user group. When you're doing one of those site-specific searches, this is a really great place to do that for if you have questions about that. Um, and then, you know, each one of, anybody who makes software, Apple, Adobe, they all have their own sections of their websites with tutorial videos, which are really great. So. Um, and they'll be able to go into, like, you know, I'm going over things really quickly and really in, in a very general way, uh, but those websites will actually break up into specific topics, and this is what you should do. So, um, when things go wrong, which they often do, and uh, as, as, as reliable as you think technology should be, things are usually going to go wrong, and it's just like, how many times do you lose your keys? Like, you know, how many times have you forgotten something simple? It's the same thing with technology. If you forget a little step along the way, like this cable's not plugged in, that happens more often than you think. People panic because they think that the technology should be working already and something's just unplugged a little bit or something like that. So I always tell people, you know, check every connection, every step along the way. Think the process through. Um, restart things, the software, the computer even. A lot of times it doesn't make sense that that would fix the problem, but sometimes it does, and a lot of your problems will go away if you do that. Um, and then always think about alternative ways you can test things. Um, for example, if I hook a camera up to this computer and it's just not working, I've checked everything, well, try it on a different computer. See if you've changed up one detail in that process, if maybe then you'll be able to get things working, and then that'll give you some clue of how to go back to your original setup and fix things. Um, it's okay to ask for help. It's 
just like it's okay to stop and ask for directions when you're driving somewhere unfamiliar. Like, it's just part of life that you should be able to ask questions. And there's a lot of very supportive people out there in the world who will be happy to answer your questions. Um, when, you're, when you do have a question, it's important to be polite uh, and to be very specific about what issue you have. You want to you want to list what software, uh, what version software, uh, what operating system, and give them all the information they can so they can help you on the first reply and not have to, to pester you for more information to be able to solve it. Um, also, just thinking about what how to ask your question will often give you the search terms you need to find the answer on your own. So if you think about it like that, like you know, the process of composing the question will actually help you. Um, and lastly, like, like everybody always tells you, like it's important to take advantage of the social nature of the internet. Um, don't wait until you have a problem to join a forum and start trying to ask questions on there. People with a low post count might not get the same attention as people who are established members of that community. Um, you can join, you, if, if everybody in this room even shared their knowledge on something like a LinkedIn group uh, or a Google group, you can find ways to, to join these types of groups um, and you become a, a resource to yourselves. Um, and maybe one person in this room knows something about Final Cut and somebody else knows something about iMovie and together you'll be able to, to do that. But also there's a lot of existing communities out there and you can just join and you know be polite and friendly and they'll They'll, they'll embrace you. So, all right, so into something a little bit more topic specific, but cameras. Um, there are a lot of cameras out there. Uh, most likely you guys don't have any film cameras, um, but that was the standard for ever and ever um, until, you know, the, the 90s or so, the 80s, when, you know, you started getting VHS tapes and then those big, huge cameras and um, and things became tape based and smaller and cheaper and people started actually having access to them. Uh, but nowadays everything is tapeless for the most part. You can still find tape cameras and stuff. Um, but the majority of you, if you guys go out and buy a camera, it'll probably be a tapeless one. Uh, tapeless ones are then generally going to have a memory card associated with them and there's a lot of types of memory cards as well. Um, but for some of you guys, you will actually have an older camera, something that's tape based, something that may be a firewire or a USB camera. Um, that top picture there, that's a firewire cable. The left, the smaller one, that's a four pin. Uh, and the one on the right, or at least to my perspective, is the six pin. They also have an eight pin, which is kind of like a more squarish box. Um, and so firewire is, uh, it was kind of a, a, the big standard for cameras and transferring uh, video data to your computer for a very long time. Um, uh, it's actually called right there IEEE -E -E 1394. It was developed by Apple. Um, they call it Firewire. Other companies have uh, th their own names for it so that's something you have to kind of like look out for. So if you're troubleshooting something like this, what does your company call it? Sony, for instance, will call it an iLink cable. So i.link. Um, so everybody calls it their own thing. The good thing about it is almost everybody uses the exact, those, those cable connections, those tips. They don't have their own proprietary version of it, you know. So you can go out and buy a standard FireWire cable as long as it connects from what your camera can take to what your computer can take, you're, you're set. It was designed to be faster. It has two-way communication. This is why production decks and stuff like that use FireWire, because if, when you're in your software here, it can talk to the deck. It's not a one-way communication streak. Um, and that's why you can rewind and play and queue up a specific section of your video for capture. Um, there's, you'll often see the terms FireWire 400 or FireWire 800, and they have other higher advanced specs which aren't very commonly used because FireWire largely is not, hasn't won the format war. It's, it's kind of on its way out, uh, but this may still be important to some of you. That number comes from the speed at which it's being able to send data. Um, the other thing about FireWire that didn't list there is also that it, because of that two-way communication, you can also daisy chain a lot of these types of things. That's why uh, they used to sell hard drives, that you could plug one hard drive right into another hard drive and that hard drive into your computer, that's because of the way FireWire is designed. It's just a very high performance uh, standard. USB, uh, universal serial bus. 
This is basically one the format war. It was uh, they have a consortium. They they vote on standards and stuff like that, just like a lot of technology out there. Um, and they continually have improved it and stuff. So you have USB, USB 2.0, USB 3.0, and there'll be a USB 4.0. And each time they improve the specifications and that they perform a little bit better. But they they were designed to be cheaper, simpler devices something to replace the, the, all the different companies making their own cables every single time. Everybody will use a USB thing. But they have a few different standard types of connections. Uh, a type A, if I can get that to go back, is that one right there that you see in the middle. Um, that's a type A connector. And uh, it'll connect to your computer. Your computer will also have a type A connector. There's also a type B connector. Micro A, Micro B, Mini A, Mini B. These are just smaller, more compact versions that you're, you're likely to see. A lot of your devices will have something like that. And it was just so they can make the cable a little smaller and, you know, uh, and, and slicker and stuff like that. Uh, this is generally the standard, but again, you don't often do anything other than connect it to a, what we call a slave device. It's like a, a, a hard drive or something like that, and you can just pull stuff, but you're not, the computer's not talking to it, trying to like do more complicated things. It's just a way of transferring things in one direction. Um, so that's basically what FireWire and USB are. Memory cards, there's a bunch of different types of memory cards. Every company wanted to come up with their own type uh, and try to get you know, everybody else to use it. Um, secure digital cards are probably the most widespread ones out there. The camera, if you were at the part one of this event, that we used was a secure digital card camera. That's a Sony Zacti. Um, and the reason why this is largely one, like the format war for cameras and stuff, is because um, memory cards, just like your, you know, if you have a thumb drive or something like that, they all use the same basic type of uh, like a file system on there. It's called FAT. It stands for File Allocation Table. And basically, it's an older file system, something that predates like what your this Windows computer here will have. Windows NTSF, I think, and this will have HSF on there because it's a Mac. But before that, like the grandfather, if you went back on the Ancestry, you would find FAT. And that system is compatible with both Macs and PCs for that reason. That's why you can plug your, your thumb drive from here and transfer stuff to your Mac. Um, the cameras are the same way. And because it's video data, and sometimes those files are so huge, a lot of times, each memory card manufacturer will have their own, like the camera, will have its own way of breaking video files into small chunks so that you have a lot of small chunks because the, there's a maximum file size on that older thing, you know, because they didn't need huge file sizes when they designed that, that system. So that's how that works. And that's also really important to know when you're transferring video files off of a memory card is depending on how they write those, uh, how they break up those pieces, you have to make sure you grab all the files when you're transferring it to your computer. Um, for example, um, .mxf is a file system like you know, you'll find on P2 cameras and a lot of these other types of things. It has like little text files to go with it. If you don't transfer those text files along with it and you wipe the card, that footage is almost useless. You'll have to, to find some special program that's going to try to recreate that and it's a big mess. So I usually tell people to grab the root of the folder, the top level folder, and copy everything at once into your computer, wherever you're organizing it. Um, some key concepts for video. Uh, again, you don't have to memorize all of this stuff. There's a lot to know. Um, 720 by 480 is obviously like standard definition. This is what had been the standard forever and ever. Uh, 1280 by 720, that's 720p, by the way. Um, that's basically what, uh, like the, the, the first step into HD. And then you have the actual HD right below that, 1920 by 1080. Um, it's just good to know that there's a difference between the numbers. And you see how they're roughly you know, uh, twice the size and stuff. And that's also going to correlate to how much file space all of those things take up on your computer. Um, aspect ratios is basically the, it's the ratio of the vertical to the horizontal. Um, 4.3 was a smaller box-like uh, standard. Uh, it's still used for you guys because sometimes casting directors prefer having a 4.3 aspect ratio because there's less empty space on either side of you, so there's less to distract you, uh, and there's less, you know, 
30 walls or whatever else you have going on in your frame. Um, 16.9 is kind of the, the universal standard now for aspect ratios for things that you shoot yourself. I threw in a couple of extra aspect ratios there for theatrical and widescreen theatrical just so you know that what you shoot isn't the same uh, ratio as what you see in theaters and stuff. Um, and so that's an important distinction to make. Uh, most of the time what they do uh, is they, they'll squish and they'll do their own thing to make their, what they shoot for theatrical fit on a DVD in 16 by 9. So that's why you'll always see on the back of a DVD box like it's got some special note about that on there. Um, you may come across the term anamorphic. That's basically a, a way of squeezing or stretching the uh, camera image. Uh, usually you put a lens on the front of your camera, it will squish everything down so that you can fit it on a, on a piece of film and use up the whole piece of that, the whole frame of the film. Uh, and then when they go to project it, they also put an anamorphic lens to kind of like reverse what they just did and therefore get a much bigger, wider image and stuff. So that, that's what, how that develops and that's still around. Um, so that's what that is. The most important thing I can think to mention about aspect ratios for you guys is uh, letterboxing and pillar boxing. You never want to burn that stuff in. And when you guys do export your videos and stuff, if, if it's not a software that handles everything for you and you have to set in some uh, your, your own settings for something, um, if you don't do it right, you should allow for time for testing and export it, make sure that things look right. But if you don't set the settings right, it's possible you might burn in a black bar on the top and bottom or on the left and right. Uh, which, you know, is not what you want. You, what you want is the actual, the whole frame should be picture, an undistorted picture, and then that's what you upload to, to whatever website you guys use. And the website will decide whether or not it has to add those bars or not. If you're not careful, you'll get what you call as window boxing, where you're trying to force it to, to, uh, to an aspect ratio that's wrong, and you might inadvertently burn in bars on the top, bottom, and the left, right. So now you have a smaller picture instead of what it should just naturally be. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit. Um, some other stuff that is good to know is interlace versus progressive. Interlace had been the standard forever and ever and ever, and basically what it means is like for old televisions and stuff, it would have like an electron gun inside that TV that would shoot the picture onto the screen line by line. And to make the process easier, it would split it up so that it would alternate lines for one and then alternate lines on the other and that's how you would get the picture and that had the benefit of making things like uh, motion uh, a lot easier uh, on your eyes and stuff it also kind of reduced flicker and other little things like that it was an analog method of being able to improve picture quality when they were dealing with this stuff back in the day uh, nowadays, everything is progressive. It means it's shooting the full picture. It's just showing you everything. It doesn't have to break it up at all. And whenever you guys upload stuff to online, and it asks you if any software asks you, like, you know, do you want this interlaced or not? Like, your your choice is progressive. Like, you want progressive for for your videos. If you somehow shot something interlaced, you want to deinterlace it and put that on the on the web. So it'd be, be progressive again. Um, all right. Frame rates, um, not to get too much into the history of frame rates, but uh, they're kind of weird numbers there. Uh, you might wonder why it's not like just straight 24 or just straight 30. Um, there is a reason for this. Um, first of all, the numbers are based off of a 60 hertz like power cycle. And back in the day, um, if they didn't sync to the power frequency and stuff, you would get things like banding on your TV. If you ever seen like you know, that, that effect where like you got kind of this rolling, you know, thing on the screen. Um, that's the type of thing that uh, that was meant to, to avoid having a number like as a multiple of 60 or. Um, but then when they had color television, um, they had to, to, to reduce this number down because some of that bandwidth needed to go to sending that extra color information. So. That little, that little difference in the number, that's the color information that they're transmitting as well. So these are the standard frame rates that you're most often going to see. And even though computers have like chips and all kinds of digital ways of handling things now, because that's been the way that we've always done things, we're stuck with these numbers now 
because um, it's the most standard and compatible with everything. So that's just you know something that's left over from a different time. Um, the next thing I wanted you guys to understand is the difference between container formats and compression codecs. Um, a container format is kind of like the box you put your compression codec inside of. Um, AVI, MOV, MP4, MPEG, these things are all wrappers. They go around the file that you're encoding. Um, DV, HDV, these are examples of compression codecs. Like, uh, you know, back in the day, mini DV tapes, that's DV. Um, HDV was the first prosumer level HD that you could do. It was a very highly compressed one. Uh, ProRes is an Apple thing. H.264 is the one I think you guys should all remember. This is the file that most everything is encoded on in the web. Um, and this is what I recommend for you guys to export your videos as before you upload it to wherever it's going to go. Okay? Um, H.264, the very bottom one there. So, it's, uh, you know, they have a whole bunch of these different types of numbers, but this is the one that's the standard one that everybody's using. So, and we'll get back to that. This is a lot of numbers for you guys. Um, you don't need to memorize these either. <laughs> um, but this just shows you the, the difference in like uh, bit rates. What uh, uh, 3.5 megabits was a standard definition bit rate. That's what your TV used to get when you get a standard definition TV signal. Uh, and you can see there, 8 to 15 is what you should be getting for HD TV. A lot of cable companies and stuff will actually like compress that number down, and that's why you get like lower quality. Like, it's it's one of those weird things where it's like, how do you define what is HD? Because it's a range of these bit rates, and depending on how how small that number or how big that number is, is how compressed or not compressed it is, and that will go into the quality of the picture that you're getting at home. Um, just some other numbers on there: uncompressed video for HD is over 1400 megabits per second. I don't know the exact number, but it can range. And it just shows you the difference between how much bigger that number is over SD. And that's why we don't work with uncompressed video. Almost everything that you guys get is going to be compressed in some way. And that's how you're able to actually fit it onto your hard drive. Okay? Uh, common bit rates for the web, and these are basically YouTube's recommended sit settings. So based on the resolution that you're shooting your stuff in. So for example, right now the live stream uh, is being streamed in 360p. Uh, so that's basically the megabits that that's going at. If we were streaming in 1080p, it would be somewhere in that range. And we could specify exactly how compressed or not compressed that signal would be. Um, and then for audio settings, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to this stuff later, but uh, 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz in this advanced audio codec. So basically what you would do is you get your video and you're ready to export it. What you want is like an MP4 wrapper with an H.264 codec, and you want to pick a bit rate, like if it lets you pick a bit rate of, you know, if you shot, if you shot it in 1080p, then you want a number between those numbers. No, lower number probably better just because that means a smaller file, and it will take less time to upload it to wherever you're uploading it. Um, some other terms you might come across. Uh, if you're trying to compress things or if you're trying to, to look at these settings, constant versus variable bitrate. This basically means like you could set a flat bitrate for constant and say that every single frame is going to be encoded with exactly that number bitrate. Whereas variable bitrate is for things like, let's say you have, you're, you've shot your action movie. There's explosions and exciting car chases and some of that stuff because uh, it's so quick and it's moving across the frame so much. You might want those things to have a little bit better quality, a little bit more bit rate, so that more information is displayed. Um, and so you would set it to variable just so that you can, it will use an algorithm and say, oh, a lot of pixels are changing on this next frame. I better give it a little bit more bandwidth so that it can uh, display in a little bit better quality. Um, fast start or compressed header, uh, that basically means that at the start of your video, it will be more compressed so that it'll load quicker on people's computers. And then it'll slowly you know, get back to your normal quality as the video goes on. Usually this is a good idea uh, because uh, of the way that we're transferring videos to each other over the internet. Um, multiple passes just means multiple passes. It basically goes through and, and says, okay, I think this is what the bitrate should be all through this video. 
And let me do another check on it, because now I'll optimize it a little bit more. Um, some compression software. Uh, if you're not going to do it straight through whatever your editing program is, um, Compressor for Apple. This is uh, something that comes with Final Cut Pro. Uh, Adobe Media Encoder, which will come with Premiere. Um, those are both really great uh, compression uh, softwares. They let you do like queuing. You can do a whole bunch of things at a time. It's got all kinds of presets in there. Um, if you want a free alternative, I use MPEG Stream Clip a lot. Uh, this works for both Mac and PC, and it's a way to, a free way to compress your video into something else if you need to. Um, and I have a note there at the bottom again. Um, make sure you guys allow enough time to test it. You don't want to be trying to figure out any of this stuff out, you know, a couple hours before you're supposed to submit your audition tape. Like, what would be good is you guys sit down, do the whole process from start to finish, test it, get a final product that you're happy with, and then you write down that, that workflow, and the next time you're ready to go. You just do it once, it's quick and easy. Even now, like when for my job, I have to always test, make sure that the, the settings that I've chose are high enough quality for what I want. You know, I might encode things a couple different times, and it might take a couple different days to uh, you know, find that level that I'm happy with. Okay? So I think that's really important. Um, there's a lot of softwares out there. Uh, we're going to cover four today. Um, the four I'm going to cover are uh, Final Cut Pro, iMovie, Premiere, and Windows Movie Maker. Um, iMovie is not free, but it is very cheap. Uh, you can get it from Apple if you want to go that route. Whereas Windows Movie Maker, I believe, is free. Um, there are other ones people use in the industry. Sony Vegas, Adobe Media Composer, uh, sorry, Avid Media Composer. Uh, you can also edit in QuickTime. Uh, it's a little weird, but you can do it that way. Um, and sometimes it's actually a really fast way of doing things and stuff because you have the ability in QuickTime to take two videos and slap them together. You know, like if you just need to put a little, you know, slate onto the front of your uh, QuickTime is a very excellent way to do that. Um, Blender is actually a 3D. Uh, compositing software like that's how you can create like animated characters and stuff but a lot of people actually do use it for editing and it's free uh, so I put that on the list just because you know sometimes people are adventurous and they're looking for a cheap option that's on there KDN live uh, that's also free and it's Mac and Linux only um, also an, that's strictly an editing thing and YouTube itself actually has functionality to let you edit and compose new videos from within the browser. It's a little frustrating because you have to wait for everything to load and you know like you're you're at the mercy of your internet speed, but in a pinch that's an option. Organization is very important and it varies uh, greatly depending on which software you're going to use. Um, softwares like iMovie and the newest Final Cut Pro are keen on trying to do all that organization for you, whether you want it to or not. Um, whereas other softwares and stuff, you will just do your own organize, organizing. Uh, I like to do things with uh, a year, month, and day, and then a project name format. Um, and every time I up, update a version of anything, I always add a underscore and then a version number at the end. If you do this, it'll make things a lot better, especially on your larger projects and stuff. If you're going back and you're, you've got your feature film that you've just you know, shot, um, way easier to organize and look at things even like a year later when you finally get picked up and now you have to do the audio mix or you know what I mean? Like, it's really good to do that. Um, make sure you back up. Uh, there's a lot of options for backing things up. One of the easiest ways to do it is just to uh, have a second external hard drive and copy everything to that. Uh, that's the cheap way of doing it. If you don't have a huge amount of stuff, I recommend also um, Amazon Glacier, which is like a web service you can upload stuff to. And uh, if you're not accessing it very often, it's very cheap. It's like one cent per gigabyte per month. So if you have like family photos or something like that, you don't need to access them 24 hours a day. Like you could put those on Glacier and just forget about them. And you pay that little fee, and you could fit a lot of pictures in there for just pennies a month. Um, uh, but other options uh, 
probably be beyond the scope of this, but you know, ray to ray drives, and then you know, you could actually burn things to Blu-ray, and you know, there's a lot of options, and it's something that's evolving. Uh, inside my folder, once I create it, I will sometimes create subfolders for all of these things, uh, just so that you uh, keep everything in their proper place, and it's quick to find things later when you do need them, instead of having to do a lot of looking around uh, in one massive folder. Um, and that's my note there at the bottom for memory cards. Make sure you copy exactly what you need since, you know, uh, you don't want to leave out any files that may be essential for interpreting that footage. And that's, oh, there we go. Uh, auditions. Uh, just a few words about this. Um, it was all covered in the part one, like what kinds of things that they're, they're expecting for. Um, but normally you'll have a close-up slate. Uh, something that's you know close up on your face and you say your name. Uh, often you'll also say uh, your height and your the scene that you guys are doing. Um, a full body tilt so they can kind of see what you look like. Uh, and sometimes they'll want a profile view and sometimes they'll want oh and they always want the performance. Um, but uh, the cast directors will almost always give you a set of instructions and that's the most important thing to pay attention to because everybody will have their own preferences and stuff so definitely follow the instructions as close as possible um, to make sure that you're not going to have any issues. Um, again, you, you want a simple backdrop. You don't want any lights in the frame because that could mess with you know, your camera's settings for trying to like, you know, give you the proper level of light uh, if it's set on auto. Uh, you don't want any other distractions in the frame. You want the best possible audio. It's always easier to re-record a take than it is to fix the audio in post, just in general. Um, so you, you usually want, like, you know, camera on board mic is usually good enough, uh, but sometimes you'll have a special directional mic, something that's picking stuff up, like, in a direction in front of the mic and trying to exclude other extraneous sound. Uh, but also you can just unplug everything, try to find a really quiet time of the day to do it, uh, whatever it takes uh, to get good audio from the start. Some software is a little bit easier to try to use to, to eliminate those extra hums and buzzes and stuff, but uh, all of that work that you do, any kind of processing that you do to your video is going to take rendering time, and then it's going to take longer for you to export and, and get that up on the web. Um, yeah, and refer to part one for more information. I think that's the end of the slideshow portion of this. Um, so the first one I want to go through on the Mac is uh, iMovie, since that seems to be a crowd favorite. And uh, I'm just going to go through the very, very basics. How do you get your footage in? How do you make simple cuts to it? And then how do you export it? And I'm going to do that for all four of, the, uh, of these softwares. Um, and then after that, I'd like to go over uh, places where you can upload stuff and uh, how to do that. So if you look here, the top left is your project library. Uh, it may not necessarily be that. If you look in the middle left of the panel here, there's actually a button to swap your interface around so that you can have your, either your project library or your event library in that top left quadrant. Um, I like to have my project up in the top left. Um, to the right, the upper right of your screen, uh, where you see this you know, graphic that you actually can create within iMovie, um, is your viewer window. Um, and then the bottom right is basically where your timeline is, kind of. So um, things about iMovie, it wants to import the footage and then put it into an iMovie folder on your desktop somewhere. Um, I actually have that folder open here, so if you look, it's actually going to be saving stuff into like your movies folder inside of iMovie events, which is something that they do that I don't, I don't necessarily like, but it's nice for some people. Um, and it'll just create a new event, and then inside that event is where all your footage is going to be copied into. Um, to the very left, right next to that swap button, is a button for open uh, your camera import window. If you have a camera where you need to digitize something, uh, like a tape-based camera, this is what you would click on uh, to bring open that interface uh, to, you know, that's basically what it looks like. 
And right now you can see me on there, <laughs> surprisingly, because um, I don't have any, any other cameras hooked up. So it's going off of the webcam right here. Um, but that's how you would do that. Uh, and it would digitize it and put it into an, a new event and everything like that. Um, something else I want to point out here is the project library. If you actually click that button, you'll see a list of your projects. And this is how you can not navigate between your different projects and stuff. And you have the same functionality for events, I believe. Well, maybe. Well, it's open. You can sh actually shut it. That's what this is. So, but anyways, uh, if you have your project and stuff, it says my first project. That's like the default name that it always gives your project and stuff. You can actually just click on there and give it a new name. Um, and that's how you guys would do your organization in iMovie and also in the newest uh, Final Cut, basically. Um, if you're happy with this, then we'll do uh, bringing in your first clip. Uh, so you just go up to File, and you can just go down here. And you can also find the Import from Camera button right there. But here you go, Import Movies. And then you can come into a folder, which I have here, post-production footage, and grab a clip. So when it comes in, it's going to want to optimize it, try to make it as easy as possible. The reason why it's doing this is because I believe this is also, sh this camera shot it in a H.264 encoded uh, codec. And um, especially in the past, computers weren't really fast enough like to, to properly play back this footage because what your computer is doing when it gets an encoded video is it has to unwrap that file and make it bigger and then you know that's what you're watching and editing with and then when you export it it rewraps it back up and that's that's basically how it works um, some some programs and stuff don't do this at all because nowadays your computers usually are fast enough just to just open it and just start cutting it and so um, before it would have been unheard of to try to edit your H.264 video stuff but now it's it's totally acceptable and stuff um, a lot of times the process would have been like if you shot in a particular format like HDV in particular because that's the most compressed of the uh, HD formats that I know of um, and it's so compressed that you can actually record that onto a regular standard definition mini DV tape and put HD footage on there like that's how compressed that format is and that's why it's so CPU intensive and so hard for softwares and stuff uh, to use so now I've got a clip here imported and um, basically uh, editing is pretty simple there's the ability to just drag and click a handlebar like uh, if you click anywhere on your video you can just click and drag and it'll actually play some audio if you do that too um, over the selection of stuff that you want and you can delete it out you can grab it and move it to a different part of your video um, there's a lot of different different functions and stuff for for how that works and stuff um, it's a lot of people find it very easy to use but uh, I'm used to having like a blade tool like in Final Cut and stuff and I find that to be the more efficient way to do it and stuff. Um, so you basically select the stuff that you want and then you bring it into your project. And now here is, and I'm going to swap these down so that it's a little bit bigger area and stuff. So it only dragged over the portions that I had highlighted by that yellow box around. And that's how you can kind of select your in and your out point so that you can drag that into your project. And then once it's in here, you can click and drag and change and you know cut by right clicking. You have a lot of extra options and stuff in here. Um, uh, so for example, I can cut this and then I can put it in front over here. And now that clip is reordered in your timeline. Um, it's really Oops. It's a really user-friendly uh, software in general. Um, just clicking and dragging and moving things around. And then when you're ready to export it, and you'll basically then just have your, your slate followed by the full body tilt, followed by the performance, and that's it. Um, sometimes people ask for a title card or something like that, but generally they don't. 
Um, and a lot of times you can actually shoot this all in one take because you should be having a second person present when you're filming your, your, your audio, uh, your, your audition. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if you do it really efficiently, you could do all of that in one take with a camera operator and just send them that whole file. Um, and they'll be okay with that. Um, as long as the audio is okay and it's reasonably well lit like we saw on the other panel and stuff, uh, people have kind of some expectation of quality and stuff. Um, and then when you're ready to uh, export your file, you can actually just come up here to the top uh, bar, uh, the, like the Explorer bar, um, and you can actually click Share. And they have a whole bunch of different preset options, but you can also just go straight to Export Movie. Um, but you can also, you know, and it has like different settings in here, what they recommend and stuff. Um, it's a lot more uh, cookie cutter in that, you know, it gives you a limited selection of options and stuff. You'll pick an option and it'll just do its thing. So a lot of those complicated things that I had in my slideshow don't even come to play here because it's taking care of that stuff for you. Uh, whether it does it perfectly or not, that's what you're, you, you should set time apart for, for experimentation. Um, so basically, you just save the file, put it somewhere on your computer, and then uh, we'll get back to that when we go to, to the upload step. So let's switch over to uh, the desktop for Windows, and I'll show you uh, Windows Movie Maker, which, while user-friendly and stuff, also has a really interesting quirk about how they like to do it. Um, as soon as that pops up. Or not. Anyways, um, the interface is going to be like if you use any other modern uh, office uh, software. It has this thing called the ribbon along the top. And each uh, tab will open up a different customized ribbon. Um, and uh, I can read it for you guys. The, um, so there's a... Uh, for, for this one, it's very simple. They have a home, an animations, a visual effects, a project, and a view. But once you actually bring footage in, it'll have another tab, which is for editing. Okay? Um, I'm still waiting on that. Can you switch back to um, Mac? And we'll go over Final Cut. Great. All right. Let's go over Final Cut in the meantime. Um, let's hide iMovie here real quick. All right. So when you open Final Cut, it'll often ask for, this is an older version of Final Cut, by the way. This is, I think, Final Cut 7. Final Cut uh, 10 is going to be a lot more like iMovie with the way that the project and the events uh, things work. It'll, it'll try to organize all that footage for you in your movies folder. Um, this is one of the reasons why like editors are kind of switching away from it lately, um, because of things like that. Um, uh, the basic interface here, if you if you look first, I'm going to open up a new project here. If you go File New Project, when you first open it, by the way, it may ask like, I don't detect your camera. You know, like you don't have to have your camera hooked up all the time. You can just sit, hit continue and open the program. Um, once, once, once you have the program open, it'll usually try to open up the last pro, uh, project that you had open. And that may not be what you want. You can just close out of that. And the way you can close out of it is you'll have your project names in little tabs right where it says effects there at the top left uh, area. Uh, and you can just right click it and say close tab. And that'll close your project. Um, but when you want to make a new project, you just come into file and say new project. And my resolution here is a little small, so let me see if I can get this to fit properly. There we go. So what I just hit there was Control U, uh, and that just resets the interface. Um, so if you ever like, you know, make your windows and hide them or whatever, you can always bring them back real quickly by using that shortcut. Um, so on the top left, you have your your project area. Um, inside there, you can see I have a little default sequence one. Um, in the top center, this is your preview, your viewer slug. This is how you can look at items um, that are in your project. 
Uh, the top right one, though, is your, your actual viewer window. And uh, that's where your actual, like where your timeline will display. And this bottom area on the, this whole area here, this massive thing is the timeline. So any video that you bring in is going to show there. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So first thing I might do is I might create a, a new bin here. And I might call it footage to keep things organized. This is only important for really big projects. Uh, if you have a lot of material, like if you shot a feature film, you have different footage shot every day or different scenes. Like it's really important to keep everything really organized here, uh, especially if you think that you may pass the project off to somebody at some point in the future. Um, you can click and drag files right into uh, this area of the window if you want. Um, or you can just go file, import, and bring the clip inside. The newer versions of Final Cut Pro will actually have the ability to uh, set up your sequence uh, with uh, your, your footage setting. Uh, and you can do that uh, when you drag your clip into your timeline. The very first clip that you drag into your timeline, it will pop up a message saying this does not match your sequence settings because we haven't set up our sequence settings yet. And if you click yes, it will automatically match them. Uh, so what, what just happened now, I have my picture there. You can notice, uh, first of all, uh, the first thing you should notice is that the, uh, there's this little red thin bar that appeared on your timeline in the center. That, that means that something there needs rendering. And by its placement, being that there's like a, t it's hard to see, but there's a tiny gray bar right above the tiny red bar. That means that the top one is the video, and the video is OK. But the audio needs to be rendered before Final Cut will play it back nicely. Uh -huh. So we're not going to play the audio, so it won't, it won't matter for us. But if you tried to play it, it would make some annoying beeping noises until you rendered it. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about here real quickly was the sequence uh, settings. So if you come up to sequence, first of all, you can find right here, this is where you can render your timeline and render exactly what you need to render, you know. Um, or you can just hit Apple R on it and that'll render it. Um, but here in sequence settings, this is what it did when, when it conformed that clip to the timeline. Um, this is, it's easy just to, to stick with what those settings are, but if you need to set up advanced settings for whatever reason, uh, or if you're using an older version of Final Cut that doesn't do that uh, for you, um, you can come in here. And basically what I would do then is I would open the clip up in QuickTime or some other software like that. Actually, let me do that real quick. So if you go to my clip, and I right click it, and I say open with QuickTime. First of all, it's really huge, so let's shrink that down by half sizing it. So if you go up to Window, and then you can go down here, there's some advanced things here, uh, and you can say, I believe it's Window Inspector, uh, Movie Inspector, and this little box that pops up, it's going to show you what the codec you used was what the resolution is, what the frame rate is. And those are the numbers you would then just plug into your sequence settings in Final Cut um, to get things to be proper. Um, and if you ever have a clip that you don't know, like somebody sends you a clip and they want help with it, this is probably one of the first things I would do is to figure out what that clip is so that I can you know, work with it properly. All right, so back to, back to here. Sequence settings are fine because it auto detected them. Um, to to make any addition uh, to cuts to this, uh, there's the blade tool. If you look over here on the right center, uh, there's a whole bunch of tools here. Um, one of them is the razor blade tool, which you can get to with the B button. Uh, there's a lot of sh everything in this will have a shortcut, some way to access it uh, without having to actually click on it. Um, but basically, that's what you would use to cut a spot. If you just click anywhere in there, you'll make a cut. If you click Shift and make a, uh, a cut, it will actually cut through all the layers at the same time. And that's what you want to do when you're trying to cut something, because you want to bring the audio with it. Uh, you can also Apple Z to undo anything that you guys have done. Um, but for example, like you know, I can 
select now I've made a cut through all the footage and now I can select and delete that you know maybe the, I left the camera running too long or something like that you can also click and drag the ends of your video but you want to be careful with um, something like uh, Final Cut because you have to move the audio and the video together or you have to specially link them so that they move together as one object um, you just want to make sure that you don't make things go out of sync or something like that and if you're clicking and dragging around like trying to now like I've cut my video down and I want my audio to, to be exactly at that level you can hold down shift and just bring it over to match that line and it'll just line up on its own shift is kind of like a thing to snap to so it'll snap straight to that to that other line that you want it to uh, and then when you're ready for exporting it you would just basically you can select your whole project here by and Final Cut. You can actually just export this as a sequence right now, or you can hit I at the front and then scroll to the very last frame and hit O. And what that did was it created these little arrows on your timeline uh, right there. And it changes the color, although it's a little hard to see, to a lighter gray. And that is now saying this is the selection that I want to export. Okay. And my process for working things in Final Cut is I always usually export things with um, export QuickTime Movie. You can also use QuickTime Conversion, um, but QuickTime Movie will just export with exactly the settings my sequence is already set to. You can give it a file name. If you look at the bottom here where it says Settings, uh, Current Settings, that means like use my sequence settings, you know, so you don't have to worry about changing it at all. Um, and then what I might do, like if this is a different format, this one's already like H.264 encoded, so I can just export it like this. Uh, if this was some other format, um, then I might then take this into compressor and do that there. The reason why I like to do it that way, I think I've heard that it gets you slightly better quality, although it's a quality difference you would never notice. Um, and second, because if you export things through Final Cut, it takes like... Uh, you can't do anything else with Final Cut in that time. But if you first export it in, in the settings that's closest to the original footage, that means it will take less time because it doesn't have to process a lot of stuff about the video. You're not special effects and all that other stuff. Um, but once it's out of Final Cut, you throw it into compressor. That can run in the background and you can do other stuff. Um, and that's why I do it like that. Um, you always want to make sure that make self, movie self-contained is checkmarked down here. If you don't, uh, it'll make a file much quicker and much smaller, but when you try to move that to another computer or do something with it, it the file won't play because it's actually referencing video that's still on your computer. So you want that to be self-contained. Um, let's see here. Let me open up Compressor real quick. Uh, actually, let me, let me cover something else about Final Cut real quick. I've kind of done things out of order. But when you first bring, open up your Final Cut, if you've never used it before, um, if you come up in here into your system settings on Final Cut Pro, you'll be able to specify here. This is, this is where your scratch files are. If you capture any footage or if it does any rendering or anything like that, it will, it will go in the folders that you specify here. Uh, so a lot of times if I make a, like if I have an external hard drive and I want that to hold all the footage, the first thing I'll do is I'll create a folder on that hard drive, you know, with the name of my project. Then I'll come in here and I'll click the set button and set all, every single one of these, and it'll create all these folders just like it shows you here, into that folder that I want everything to be in. And that basically keeps all the files together. You know, you keep your footage, keep all of the rendering stuff and your project files. All of that will be in the same spot if you do this. And then I would save the project uh, in that folder as well. Uh, and that way, like if you transfer it to another hard drive or give it to an editor or something like that, all the files are there and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you may have to do this on a, then a project by project basis uh, to keep things really organized and clean. Uh, if you don't do this and it's just on the default you know, folder uh, the way that it's set now, uh, Every project you open is all going to save that stuff into the same area, and it'll be you know it'll consume more and more space, and you'll wonder where all your space is gone, and it'll be hard for you to figure out this much space is going to this project, this much space is going to that project. By keeping things clean and organized, um, 
you'll just save headaches later. Uh, and then you can easily delete a project when you no longer need it anymore. Or if you want to burn it to a disk or something like that, you can just burn that whole folder into a disk and you know, you'll be fine. Um, I'd also wanted to go over a compressor just a little bit here. Um, so for compressor, um, this is where you would actually see some of those advanced settings and stuff. So it'll always open up a little window and stuff trying to get you to uh, to set up a, a default template and stuff. There's a lot of little windows here that are hard to see. This is the preview. You don't really need it at all, uh, but it will let you see the difference between your original footage and uh, and what the proposed compression that you're applying to it would be look like. This top left one that always opens up, this is where you drag your files. Um, I'm, I'm going to do that real quick so that you can see something here. So you would click and drag your file right into Compressor. So let's say that was the one that I exported. Um, so once you have your file up here, this settings box right here is where you can go through and find a preset that you want to apply to that video. Um, so for our purposes here, if you scroll down through them, you'll see formats and then QuickTime and then you'll eventually find one here that's QuickTime H264 with AAC audio. And you can just click and drag that right onto your video. And then basically it would be after you're happy with the settings and you can see what those settings are with this window here that's called the inspector. Um, that'll show you exactly what settings it's going to apply. So if you click on the QuickTime H.264 uh, that you want to apply, and then you click on here on the uh, inspector, you can see a summary of all of the, the settings and stuff right there. And you'll see some of the terms that we went over in the PowerPoint uh, written in here. And if you click over through these tabs, you'll see additional settings and stuff. This is the one, the first one over from the, the, the default one is where you can actually set your video quality settings. And that's if you click video settings here, you have all of the options. Uh, so for example, if you look at the top right for data rate, it says automatic. Uh, that's gonna, that basically means it's going to use this quality slider wherever it says it's set the best right now. If you click and drag that over, you'd be using, uh, it'd be more compressed and fi smaller file sizes. Um, around high, it's about 80% quality. Um, so anywhere above 70% is generally a good setting for compression and stuff when you're doing things this way. 100% uh, is obviously the highest quality, but the biggest file and stuff. Um, you have the multi-pass, single pass, the same things that we talked about earlier. Uh, but you want to keep almost all the, the rest of these settings the same. If you wanted to do a constant bit rate uh, thing all throughout, you could say restrict to and then actually just type in your bit rate right here. And that, that's what, where those numbers come into play. So basically the process here for you guys, uh, especially if you didn't remember any of that stuff, which you shouldn't, uh, would be then to, to do some research find that optimal bit rate that YouTube is like, please submit stuff with this bit rate. And you just put that number in here and then hit OK. And then when you hit submit here, it will process the file. And that'll happen, you'll see it in, in this long list of, I have a lot of things I've rendered here, so normally there'd be nothing in there. Uh, but it, it'll go through and do its process and stuff. And afterwards, when it's done, you'll have a new video file, which you can test and see you know, everything is good. And then that's the file you'd upload. So that's the general process for those two programs. Let me see if we can switch back to Windows now. Let's see if that works. Maybe not. I could, but that would be really weird. <laughs> she asked if I could use the webcam to point at my other screen. Um, 
Got it. All right. All right, uploading, and we'll do this off of this computer then. Can you switch back to the Mac, please? Mm -hmm. So, all right. All right, so first of all, um, you want to name your file appropriately. Um, I need internet here. Um, so basically, your casting director will probably ask for a particular way of naming things. It might include the project name that they're trying to organize things. They may have many projects going on at the same time. You definitely want to have your name in there, um, but the project name might go in there as well. And you just want to follow those instructions, but you never want to upload something like, if I just uploaded that video that I was playing with, it would be called like MOV0004, like, you know, like, How's that going to help the casting director? So you want to think things through a little bit for that. Um, so depending on your internet connection, uh, fast internet connection will make things go a lot smoother when you're trying to upload things. Um, if you have a slow connection, you want to be able to set aside the time to, to upload things. And hopefully you guys have all tested and tried uploading videos before it's crunch time. So you know exactly how long it's going to take you to upload a video. Um, you can also go to something like speedtest.net uh, to, to measure your internet speed. So you can kind of get a gauge of how fast or how slow your connection is. Um, again, you'll probably need to have Flash installed. Um, here I'm already lo logged into uh, YouTube. Uh, but basically, to upload a file to YouTube, uh, first of all, there's there's a lot of websites you can upload video to. Uh, the two I recommend for you guys is are YouTube and Vimeo, uh, both because of the, the wide uh, user base uh, and the, the quality of the, the video that you upload. But there's also a lot of uh, YouTube is uh, Y-O-U-T-U-B dot com. Uh, hopefully everybody knows it. It's yeah. the second biggest search engine by itself now. Um, Vimeo is the other one, V-I-M-E-O dot com. Um, both of them have privacy options, and this is incredibly important for you guys. When you guys are uploading stuff, like you have to be careful because sometimes that script that you've just read, that's not something for public consumption, and you don't want to upload it to somewhere where everybody can see it. Um, a lot of times, casting directors will then specify specifically, I want the file, you send me the file. And you can use uh, something like yousendit.com or Google Drive or Dropbox. All of these things have an ability to upload a file and then share a link specifically with the casting director. There are some pitfalls when you try to upload something like that because, um, one, you have to make sure that you've given them a file that they're going to play back easily. Uh, so hopefully you've followed the instructions, you've tested the video and stuff, and things are good. Um, the last thing you want is to, to do something weird, uh, send them a file, and they can't open it. You know, This is why I prefer YouTube and Vimeo, because when you upload it, they do their own compression stuff for the web. And the file that they put up is going to be exactly the same as all the other files on YouTube. So as long as the caching director can watch anything on YouTube, then you're fine. You know. Um, uh, a way to, to do stuff through there for actors access as well. Um, so if you if you click the upload button here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and select a file to upload, and we'll grab the uh, the same file here. As it starts to upload, you can actually name the file, do all the stuff that you need to do here. Right now, if you look over here on the right, uh, you got privacy settings. What you don't want is to set it to public. You want to set it to either unlisted or private. What unlisted means is it means anybody with the link to the video can see it. That's less secure than private. The reason why YouTube is not necessarily the best way to send stuff is if you want to send it private, you need to know uh, what your casting director's YouTube uh, account was so that you could share it specifically with them and most cast directors aren't probably going to want to send you that anyways 
But if you're OK and they're OK using an unlisted file, then you can do that. Um, you just give it all the name and stuff properly and stuff, and it'll just do its stuff. And it'll, it's very easy to share. It gives you the link to the video right there while it's uploading. And you can visit that link, and you can see that this video is still being uploaded, or it's actually still being processed. Um, so it's really quick and easy. I'm actually going to cancel this now because I don't want that on my YouTube channel right now. Um, but let me show you the options for Vimeo as well. Hopefully I remember this. Yep. All right. Um, so if you go up here to upload, and you can choose a video to upload, and I can grab that same video. And you can click upload these selected videos here. It's going to start uploading. If you click over on privacy, which is the second tab, first of all, you want to you know, give it a name that's appropriate, again, uh, and a description and whatever else you need to do. But then on the privacy tab, it has this special option at the bottom, only people with a password. And you can actually type in a password here. And then when you send the casting director the link, they'll also have to enter the password. And this is just the most secure way I can think of to share a video online. There's also the added benefit if you scroll down a little bit here on this settings page it says what can people do with this video and there's a little tab that says download the video for casting directors that want the video on a on their hard drive so that they can then send it or bring it over to another uh, you know casting director to have them view it or the director or whoever else and keep all that together uh, that's that's you, you would keep that as an option and then when they visit your video there'll be a link at the right below the video to download this video to your computer. And that's why I like Vimeo a lot for this purpose. So if I had to choose one, I would choose Vimeo. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think we can start with questions. And in the meantime, can you try switching over to the other one? And maybe I can get that to work. Let's see. Um, So in Sony Vegas, the preview viewer has terrible lag with HD on a computer that is not incredibly fast. There is no practical solution I can find online. Do you know of any? Um, it depends on what your footage is, first of all, how highly compressed it is. Uh, if you're trying to do this as an HDV file and you have a slow computer, there is really nothing you can do to speed up that, that, that video playing in your Sony Vegas. Um, things that can help are to transcode or compress, that's the same word. Transcode is when you take a format and put it into another format. Um, if, you, if you do that into a less compressed format, so basically making the file size a lot bigger uh, for that video, there's a chance that that may help with your performance in there. How does that happen? What You, you would use like compressor, Adobe Media Encoder, or MPEG Stream Clip, or some other software. There's a lot of them out there, a lot of free ones too. Um, but you would use something like that, and you'd, you'd know what you're doing. You'd, you'd want to keep the same aspect ratio. you want to keep the same frame rate, the same resolution. Or you might not. It depends. Um, if, you, if you lower the, the resolution you know, from HD to standard definition, you'll be able to play that thing back a lot uh, easier. Also, you may be able to get away with that anyways because you don't really need HD quality on an audition tape. Uh, standard definition will do you just fine. This live stream is in 360p, which is less than standard quality, uh, standard definition quality. And you can still maximize it. It gets a little bit fuzzy, but um, it's, it's still a decent quality. And your casting director will most likely be happy with it. So um, what is MP4? What is MPEG? Um, those are both uh, container formats. So they are, uh, they have an acronym. They mean something. I don't know what they mean. Um, but the point is that they're just a type of file. Just like an EXE file on your, on your Windows computer is a type of file. Um, and these things are just that. 
In the EXE, it has inside a lot of code that can run and install programs and stuff like that. In the case of an MP4 or an MPEG file, uh, those basically mean uh, that you know it's got video information inside. It's a way for the computer to identify this as a video file and to look at the appropriate spot to find out what kind of codec and how to play it back. Like that's all internal computer logic stuff. Um, what is streaming? Streaming is what we're doing now with the live stream. It basically means that we're sending data from here over the internet to somewhere else. Um, what is burning to? Uh, <laughs> this is a process by which you uh, put in either a DVD, a CD, or a Blu-ray disc, depending on what kind of drive you have. Uh, you'll use software like, uh, on Mac, uh, DVD Studio Pro, or um, Toast is a really great software for the Mac um, for burning data format. And let me explain that, too. Data format means that you're burning a disk that's meant to go to other computers. Uh, and it's going to have kind of like, it's going to be like your external hard drive. It's going to have a list of files on there. Usually, you'll want to transfer those files to your computer before you try to open them or play them back because the speed at which the disk spins in your drive is not as fast as that hard drive. Uh, therefore, it'll take longer to buffer, and you'll have issues trying to play videos straight from one of those things off of a data disk. So you copy that over to your computer first, and then you can play back or edit or do whatever you need to do with that footage. Um, you can. Depending on the size of the file, a CD is the most universal, smallest one. It's like 700 megabytes of spuff. It doesn't fit a whole lot of uh, high-quality video on there, but compressed video can fit on there just fine. Um, DVDs are up to 4.7 gigabytes or 9.6 gigabytes if you have a dual-layer DVD. Um, and you can hold a lot more files on there. Uh, Blu-ray, it's, it's about 25 gigabytes. It's slightly less than that. Uh, 24.7 or something like that. You can fit a lot more stuff on there and then you can get a dual layer Blu-ray which would then be about 50 gigabytes. Um, so if you have really big projects, very high quality or camera original stuff, then, then you can use a thing like that. Uh, what is exporting? Exporting is the process by which uh, you uh, take a video that's in your software that's being worked on and save it as a file and it's going to go through the process of encoding it with whatever codec or settings and stuff uh, you have set in that software. And, uh, and then you'll have a file afterwards, a completed file, which you can move to another computer and play it in a different pl uh, player. And that's what that is. Um, and how do you burn something to a disk? We kind of covered. but So Toast uh, on Mac is a great software for burning data disks. Um, DVD Studio Pro on a Mac is a good software for burning a playable disc. That means something that I could put into a standard DVD player hooked up to your TV and play back the content. Um, on, the, on the PC side, um, Image Burn is a good free program for burning data discs. You can also get um, Nero for burning uh, data discs. That's a paid software on Windows. And then um, Adobe has a, a really good way of burning playable disks on there. Uh, that's it's slipping my mind right now, but they uh, Encore. It's called Encore. Uh, and you can use that to create DVD menus and playable disks Adobe through that. Can be used on Mac or just Adobe can be Encore can be used on Mac as well. Their whole suite of software is both uh, PC and Mac friendly. Pricey, yes, very pricey. So, but Image Burn is great for, and, and they have other free ones if you want to burn playable discs. That's something that you would go back to step one of my presentation of how do you research things. Like if I wanted to find a, a free program that did something, I would first do some basic searches, try to find out which websites are, you know, because everybody likes to post that kind of content on their blog, the five best, you know, softwares that do this. I find out which softwares do that, uh, which websites post things like that, and then I can do a site-specific search on that site and say, best burning software. And then I'll get a whole bunch of articles, and you can click them and read them and see the pros and the cons, and that's how I find new things. Yelp, Yelp is great as well. Um, 
but that's more for like businesses and stuff like that, but sometimes for products uh, as well. Um, if we're gathering clips for our reel from iTunes TV episodes, how do we convert it to a file type that we can work? Um, I'm not sure if they have a specific type of formatting for iTunes episodes. Um, if they do, like the, just like, uh, for example, like their songs and stuff, like if you buy a song off iTunes, it has a special format for them. And if you want to put them in something else, it's basically circumventing the protection that they've put into place. There are lots of websites out there that will give you that information for how to basically rip the information out of their format and put it into a format that's a little bit more open. Um, and so you could basically just research that. Um, you could try opening it in um, MPEG Stream Clip and see if that opens it, and maybe you'll be able to, to do something with that. Um, you can also try VLC. as this VLC is a player, like QuickTime, uh, that's very good at opening things, and sometimes you can then export out of there into other stuff. Um, if you have a good microphone you use for voiceovers, can you record audio on that? How would you then add that audio to the video in Windows Movie Maker? Oh, all right. Uh, well, we didn't get the cover Windows Movie Maker, so it's kind of hard to answer that part of it. Um, if your microphone can interface straight to your camera, that's the first, the best way to get it on there. You want the video to be synced to the audio right from the start. You can sync them later and stuff, but it's a little bit more complicated. And then you may get into things like, you know, recording it at a different frame rate than what your video is being shot at, and that adds complications. So just be aware that there is some complexity to trying to add audio that's separately recorded from your video. Um, sometimes you can uh, just you know change the duration to make it match your video, but that will also sometimes alter the pitch of your voice. Um, so you may have to then do some additional processing to get things to fit if you didn't record them in the same frame rate. So it's really important to, to do that. Uh, most cameras will either have a way to input uh, by a standard uh, mic port. It's a 3.5 millimeter uh, audio jack. It's a pretty standard uh, plug. Or an XLR input, um, which is a little bit more professional. Uh, none of them use like phono cable type stuff. Um, so if you can do an output from your mic into uh, that, that's how you would hook it into your camera and just record it straight from the start. Uh, this is also why on movie sets and stuff, they have a, like an audio guy there who's in charge of you know making sure things are synced properly, even if it's recorded separately and stuff. Um, that's what that guy's job is, is to make sure that everything syncs properly. So, What is raw footage? Raw footage is usually refers to the camera original footage that you shoot. So, uh, for example, on that camera that we shot in the last event, uh, the Sony Zacti, the raw footage in that case would be that compressed H.264 encoded video. Uh, that is not uh, what we, in the industry, we would usually call raw footage. Raw footage, usually we, we would call that, uh, uh, you know, DVC Pro HD or, uh, you know, these types of things. And it's also the, another way of referring to the original camera, what was shot on the camera. It's not something that you've edited down. It's not something that, you're, um, that you've played with or processed in any way. Uh, it's the original stuff that you got off of the camera. What is the most universal file format to play on most computers? Which ones will not play on some computers and programs? Um, the most universal one, like I said, I think uh, H.264 is the, the modern codec that's most universal. Um, a lot of people, uh, MPEG would be another good one. If you think about DVDs and Blu-rays, both of those things are encoded in MPEG. You know, they're different versions of MPEG. Um, MPEG-2 for DVDs and I think MPEG-4 for Blu-rays. Um, that's a pretty universal one as well. Um, some stuff, you know, you may encounter issues and stuff where uh, I think that you'll have no problem on Macs with MPEG or anything that you do that's H.264. What's so, a Blu-ray? Blu-ray is a high-definition DVD. Uh, it uses a different format. They had this whole little format war between HD 
uh, discs and Blu-ray discs. Sony did uh, Blu-ray and they won the format war there, so now everything is those. Um, you'll usually find them, they're slightly smaller uh, cases for them. Uh, and they'll usually be in a blue tinted plastic uh, box. You'll find them, if you go to any store that sells movies, uh, you'll see a section for DVD and a section for Blu-ray. Um, so that's that. Um, you can play them on computer? It depends if you have a Blu-ray player. Uh, your CD drive needs to actually be a Blu-ray CD drive. Mm -hmm. So if it's not, then you can't just pop it in. You'll have to buy one. Good news is they're very cheap. Bad news is it's a little complicated to install one into your computer. Um, you'd actually have to open up your case and put in a new thing, and your computer would have to be fast enough to be able to play and process that Blu-ray movie. Okay. Um, please elaborate again on the need to transfer all the memory card files. What kind of media are we talking about? Please explain step by step so I might know what I'm missing when I download my stills and photos. So on a normal camera, uh, you'll see a file, a folder file, inside your camera when you try to hook it up, or the memory card when you hook that up, uh, that'll say DCM. Uh, inside of there, typically if you see anything in there, you'll see movie files, .mov files, or some other format, uh, or you'll see the stills, which are like JPEGs or uh, however, whatever format they are. Um, those files are generally safe. You can just copy parts of them. They're all they're self-contained. But when you open up a file, a folder on your memory card, and you see something like BPAV, B-P-A-V, or some other file extension uh, f uh, name in there, that usually means that the camera has done some special way of formatting that stuff. And a lot of times, if you open that folder, you'll see, like, for example, if you shoot on a camera that has multiple memory cards, it'll break it up to card one, card two. You'll want to copy that entire card folder, everything that's in there, over. Uh, the particular files that you have issues with with this are the MXF files. Uh, there are other file formats as well, but it's .mxf. It stands for Materials Exchange Format. And um, they'll have like text files associated with these clips, and it'll break up the video into video clips and uh, audio clips and the text files associated for how to interpret those things. You need all of those things uh, together to be able to do that. Um, I'll do a couple more of these real quick, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up. So what about using the cloud for storage? Is this a viable idea? The Amazon Glacier was an option that I mentioned that that's cloud storage. Uh, it uses their huge amount of Amazon servers all over the world. They guarantee it with like 99.999, like infinity uh, certainty, uh, and it's cheap. Uh, as long as you don't have like you know huge amounts, like if you're Sony, you might not want to put all of your stuff on cloud because it would add up. But if you guys have just you know a few gigabytes worth of stuff, incredible cheap option and stuff. The 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 drawback is that the files aren't immediately accessible because I believe how they're doing that is they actually have a tape vault, like it's a giant machine the size of like this room almost like. It has all these tapes and robotic arms and stuff, and it grabs a tape and moves it over, and it's, it's intense. Um, and that's how they do that. But because of that, then when you want your files back, you say, please, I want my files. And it says, check back in 24 hours. We'll give you a link to download it. You know? And that's how that works. Um, What's the link? Uh, you would just Google or search for Amazon Glacier. I, I don't know what the specific link is. Uh, Dropbox is an amazing uh, website for storage stuff online. Google Drive is another one. Both of them are free up to a point, and if you need additional storage, you can pay for that. They also also a whole bunch of different cloud storage things as backups for your computer. Like if you wanted to protect your computer, there's a lot of services out there. They're all paid services and stuff, um, but that's how you do that. I'm not sure I can read that one. How do you connect a wireless microphone to a cell phone? Um, <laughs> most likely that would be like a Blu-ray type thing. Uh, if, if it's meant to hook up to it at all, um, you know, the bottom of your cell phone will also have like a, a mic in port. Uh, this is not as common anymore because uh, we use Bluetooth headsets and Bluetooth whatever. Um, 
With Bluetooth, you would pair it to your device. Uh, you'd have to follow the instructions there. Usually it's like holding the power button and getting it to sync, and you have to turn your cell phone on to discoverable mode so that you can get that to hook up. The older, in, on the older cell phones, you could just plug something in, and you know sometimes it would have to be manufacturer-specific. How do I get footage from a DVD to upload onto an actor service website? If you want to get footage off of a DVD, first of all, um, it takes time because it, it has to go through and play the video and it's going to be ripping it. You have to use something, a DVD ripper software. Um, there's a lot of them out there, but the one I like is MPEG Stream Clip. It can, just like it can compress stuff, it can also open up a DVD and encode whatever you find. Just remember that the quality that you get off of a DVD is not great. Like, you always want to get the original footage from, like, if you could, uh, from the editor on your project and stuff, if you can. The DVD, it depends on how they compress it and stuff, but you lose a lot of information when they try to make that DVD. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that. So. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for coming and for watching us on the live stream. And I'm happy to answer your questions afterwards if you need. So thank you. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Windows Movie Maker is really, it's, it's really basic software.